If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to the book of James, chapter 3 and verse 17. As I get into this message this morning, let me tell you what I want you to notice. I want you to notice that everything that's said about wisdom is really a characteristic trait of Jesus. So if it says, and wisdom is first pure, Jesus is pure. If wisdom is peaceable, peace-loving, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So everything it says about him. It's also true when the Bible talks about the armor of God. And the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And also in the book of Romans. Every piece that you put on is a portrait and a characteristic trait of the Lord Jesus. So what I'm going to say about mothers and wisdom today is I don't know of anyone in the family that is more like Jesus than mothers. That's just the way it is. Sorry, Dad. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. James chapter 3, verse 17, written by the half-brother of Christ. James 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruit, and without partiality and without hypocrisy. Speak into our lives today and help us to be a blessing in particular to the moms. For Christ's sake, amen. You may be seated. If anyone in the world needs wisdom, it's our mothers. James Dobson said, there's few assignments in the human experience that require the array of wisdom needed by moms in fulfilling her everyday duties. She must be resident psychologist, physician, theologian, educator, nurse, chef, taxi driver, fire marshal, occasional police officer, and if she succeeds in each of these responsibilities, she gets to do it all over again tomorrow. I just wrote a one-liner, what came to mind when I think about my mother. My mother was the glue that literally held the Hunt family together. George Washington said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute all my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. Emmanuel Kant said, I shall never forget my mother, for it was she who planted and nurtured the first seeds of good within me. She opened my heart to the lasting impressions of nature. She awakened my understanding and extended my horizon and her precepts exerted an everlasting influence upon the course of my life. Thomas Edison said, my mother was the making of me. She was so true and so sure of me. I felt that I had someone to live for and someone I must not disappoint. The memory of my mother will always be a blessing to me. So I want to spend just a minute by way of introduction to say a word about the moms of our children. Winston Churchill said, my most brilliant achievement was my ability to be able to persuade my wife to marry me. <laughs> Proverbs 18.22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You got a good wife? That's God's favor on your life. Proverbs 19.14 says, Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Now, I'm going to marry mothers and wisdom today. John Blanchard defined wisdom by saying it's the ability to discern God's hand in human circumstances and apply heavenly judgment to earthly situations. James 3.17, we read of wisdom that is divine in origin. The Bible says it's from above. It comes from heaven. Solomon knew wisdom. Proverbs 2.6, the Lord gives wisdom, his mouth and knowledge 
give understanding. Paul knew wisdom. Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Colossians 1.9, for this reason we also, since today we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, Let's just go as far as we can instead of me burden you with how many points I've got to this message. Let's just start at number one and maybe unless you've got my notes in front of you, you don't know how far we're going to go. The first characteristic that the Bible mentions that wisdom is, and remember this is a character trait of Christ and I believe it is so beautiful of mothers, is purity. By the way, there's eight words that are listed and the reason we call seven characteristics instead of eight A couple of them are married, number one. And number two, most scholars believe that purity speaks more of the motivation behind wisdom than a characteristic of. Matter of fact, listen to this. You've heard this said before. If the first is not first in priority and importance, the other will not be of use to you. So I'm just going to say this to you. When we make light of the need for pureness in our motives and in our manners. The other components of wisdom are not yours to enjoy. And that's a very big statement. It's like this. If you don't get this one right, the others don't matter. And so when the Bible says, did you see the language of the Greek New Testament? It's clear in the way it's listed there. Is first pure. That implies spiritual integrity. It carries with it the connotation of being undefiled and morally blameless. While the wisdom of the world results in perversion, the wisdom of the word results in purity. Note, purity stands first in the list, but also first in priority and in importance. There's no hidden motives in God's wisdom. This serves as the very key to all qualities of wisdom to follow. An overarching attribute, if you will. The authenticity and intensity of one's purity determines the outworking of all the other qualities of wisdom. Now hear me again. It's an oxymoron, but the Bible speaks of a demonic wisdom. You may think, well, wait a minute, is it demonic or is it wisdom? The demonic defines that it is wisdom that is of the earth, that it is sensual, it is fleshual, it is demonic, it is not of God. And yet then the Bible says, but there is a contrasting wisdom, wisdom from heaven. Sometimes someone says, I'm telling you, I believe I'm right in this, but I'm telling you if they're not pure in their motives and pure in their manner, and if there's not this moral blamelessness in their life, They don't have the capacity to hear from God as they ought. The Bible teaches in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 1 that the Lord's arm is not short that it cannot save and his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But our sin separates us from hearing what God would speak into the life of one of his servants. So it involves moral purity before God and devotional purity in one's focus on him. And so first and foremost, here's what I'd have to do. This is how you would approach this devotionally. You would bow before God and say, Lord, you know the private life of Pastor Johnny. Oh, God, I desire to be as as passionate about being pure inwardly as I am outwardly. Speak into my heart. Oh, God, bring me to the place that I'm constantly confessing anything that would be an offense to who you are. But then he says, and now once you've got that in place, and wow, that's a biggie, the whole sermon could go there. Then he says it's peaceable. Translates peaceful and peace-loving. By the way, to be peaceful is always an outgrowth of purity. The absence, this is good, the absence of purity will always be accompanied by the absence of peace. Listen to what my Bible says in Isaiah 57 verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There's no peace, says my God to the wicked. If your heart is wicked instead of pure, you may be able to extend peace, but you cannot experience peace. But I'm telling you, put the two together. Oh, joy unspeakable and full of glory. It is really something to be able to sing it and mean it in the depth of your soul. I've got peace like a river in my soul. Let me tell you how this peace works itself out. It's threefold. Listen to me. Number one, 
when you have peace, wisdom type peace, it has an upward expression. Peace with God. I don't know of anything that will give you a softer pillow at night than the conscience before God and man that all sins are confessed. You have no ill will with a brother or sister. You love everyone. Peace with God. Upward expression. Number two, inward expression. When you have peace with God, it overwhelms you to have peace with ourselves. Number three, it's an outward expression. Now, stay with me now because this is how it flows. It's first of all, upward peace. I'm at peace with God. It's inward peace. I'm at peace with myself. And it's outward peace. I'm at peace with others. Wow. That's what it means to be peaceful. So the world's wisdom brings competition, conflict, and confusion. Boy, competition, sure killer relationship. But the wisdom of the word brings peace. Now, when peace is woven into the fabric of our lives, we no longer wish to be abrasive or injurious. Instead, we become soothing, healing influences. So when this attitude rules, it guards us against alienating others and creating ill will. I mean, I don't want to alienate anybody. I don't want to create ill will. So this quality is foreign to us because by nature we battle with others and set people at distance from ourselves. And, and what's going on is it's not wisdom. You're not wise to do that. But be pure in your motives and your manner. Let peace flow from your life. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people. Let me give you the third word. The third word is gentle. It refers to one who does not insist on their rights. It means not being harsh or critical. So this type of wisdom and actions allows, listen to this, it allows for ignorance and limitations of others. Let me, can, I, can I share with the congregation since I've been going through some times of trying to lead some stuff that's bigger than I am, to say the least, and God's been working in my heart and getting me up very early to pray. He's been calling me to regular days of fasting and seeking his face and humbling myself before him and turning from my own wicked ways. And, and in that context, God has reminded me that the church is short on Aquilas and Pasillas. There's some mighty people out there called Apollosis that sometimes don't just get it right. So in their ignorance and limitations, somebody comes alongside with kindness and shows them a better way. By the way, listen to this. Let me, let me say something about this word gentle. I think those of you that are students of the word will enjoy this. Did you know there is no equivalent to the word in the Bible for gentleness in the English language? Not a one. So all the commentators can do is come together and use words that are close in their ending phrases in the Greek New Testament to delineate a word that would come close. It carries the idea, they'd say, of equitable, fair, not only be fair, moderate, uh, courteous, and considerate. Now, we know that it's the fruit of the Spirit. You can't produce it on your own. Uh, Galatians 5.23 says that God produces it in you. A general person is humbly patient. Listen to this. Submits to dishonor and abuse. Jesus was reviled. How did he respond? Gentleness. Boy, it's so hard to respond like Jesus sometimes, isn't it? Uh, when there's mistreatment, try to be gentle. When you're persecuted, try to be gentle. So the, it's the, really, it's the quality of an approved servant. Paul talking to Timothy, no soon he's going to die. He says in 2 Timothy 2.24, and the servant of the Lord, that's what I want to be, I'm the the diakonos, the doulos, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. He, he needs to be able to teach, and he needs to be patient in his humility, he corrects those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so they may know the truth, but do it humbly, do it gently. It describes the kind of person who, though wronged and possessing the right not to bend, nevertheless foregoes their right. Sometimes someone says, you ought to stand up for your own rights. Well, this is one time where if you're going to be like Jesus, you surrender your rights for the good of the person you're attempting to help. So 
the person with this quality makes allowances for the weaknesses and ignorance of others and takes the kindest perspective whenever possible. The quality was often mentioned of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 2 Corinthians 10, 1. Let me give you a fourth one. Wisdom, the epitome of Jesus Christ, seen so much in our precious mothers. Willing to yield. Uh, the King James says, easily to be entreated. That really could be defined submissive. Willing to submit to the persuasion or open to reason. Open to reason. You say you believe something. You say you're going to do something. Someone that loves you, that's wise, that may be a little further down the road. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're young but wise. And they say, I've been thinking about what you're doing and I'm, I'm concerned for you. I would ask you to look at this part of what you're dealing with as well. Conciliatory in the sense of yieldedness once someone else weighs in on a situation, which leads to a readiness to admit that even I might be wrong. Boy, that's something, isn't it? I might be wrong. Persuadable, that's what it means. It means this person, if you show them the facts and facts are our friends, they may come to the point to say, you know what? You've, you've, you've helped me there. I, I see where what I said was not good. Uh, the wise are open to reason, teachable. It speaks of the opposite of stubbornness. It portrays wisdom that is willing to be instructed further in order to know the truth so that we may learn and obey. Have we not all had those type people in our life? But then let me go a step further. I want to put these two together. Full of mercy and good fruits. That's good, isn't it? Full of mercy and good fruits. It speaks of productivity. This is true. Now, let me just show you how y'all say you like the precept on precept. Let me tell you what precept on precept is. First and foremost and important, and if you don't get this right, you can't go any further. It's back at one. Isn't that a good country song? Back at one. Uh, you repeat. So you've got to go back uh, if you don't get this one right. You get this one right or you do it over. And so um, I'm first desiring. And I know you do, and every mom does, and every person here does, desires to be pure in their motive and in their manner. And then it leads to this peaceable life, and you find yourself being gentler and, and more kind and considerate of others, so much like Jesus. And then you, in that context, find yourself willing to yield. In other words, you're open. You're not abrasive. You're not always right. But somebody speaks in your life, and you say, I never thought about it like that. And it, it opens it, and you say, thank you. You helped me, and you're willing to change in whatever way you receive correction. Now, I want you to listen to this. Here's how it is. Guess what begins to happen in your life when these first four become a reality? You become productive as a Christian. I don't know about you. Look at me. I don't know about you. I do not want to live my Christian life, and at the end of my days, there be nothing called good fruit are y'all listening I want to be productive I want if God lets me live long enough to see some of the produce of my labor now I know that it's it's incomprehensible you won't be able to know everything that God has done with you but you will along life's way you'll you'll be able to many times you you moms will be able to look at your son and say you know what he turned out good you, you'll be able to say, look, look at my daughter. She turned out good. What a difference wisdom from above makes in one's lives. When the Bible says mercy and good fruits, here's what it means. Stay with me. This is good. I may not be able to get much further, but stay with this. It's compassion in action. In my heart this week, I was laying before the Lord, and I said, God, give me understanding of mercy and good works being married. Here's a good definition. You're not afraid to touch the leper. See, a lot of people will come to the aid of good people when they need them. But somebody told me the greatest friend is when everyone else has walked out, they walk in. They're not afraid to be associated with you. Some of you might would think, I, I wouldn't want to be seen in public after it became public what they did. You're afraid to touch the leper. But wisdom says, mercy, and by the way, let's just define it in childlike language. Mercy 
is God not giving Johnny Hunt what he deserved. Mercy. Thank God for mercy. And then how do you marry good works, mercy and, there's a conjunction bringing them together. You're not afraid to touch the leper. It speaks, give me a personify, a personification of this word. The good Samaritan. The preacher won't touch him. The minister of music won't touch him. But the half-breed walks over to where he is, offers him his only ride, pours in his oil, takes him to a hotel, and says, take care of him. Thank God for people that aren't afraid to touch the leper. You see, it's concern and compassion married for anyone he encounters who's suffering or who needs any kind of support or assistance. It speaks of a person. Listen to this. I want to make sure you understand the language. It speaks of a person who, even though personally wronged, that is you, reaches out to help the offender in whatever way is needed. What in the world are you doing? The man could have ruined you. What are you doing extending him a hand? We had thrown our sinful assaults at the Son of God and in mercy he reached out in good works and would you not call Calvary a merciful good act? Some can't help those that have hurt or wronged others. Much less those that hurt them. Worldly wisdom is often apt to be cynical and hard toward the misfortunate and others. And this quality of wisdom bears with their sins. It pities their sorrow. It feels for their suffering. It's fruitful uh, in their practices. So the way this word speaks of the way of the Lord and how he deals with us, it's marrying mercy. Mercy is an attitude. Good works is its fruit. Mercy is how I feel. Good works is what I do, and we need to put them together. Let me just close this message, and I'm not through, but when have I been? But let me close it with a quote. He used such big words, you need a dictionary to define it, but I want to quote him. Listen to this. Kent Hughes is one of my favorite writers. Kent Hughes said of this passage, James, now stay with me, listen to this last statement, don't check out on me. James, the unrelenting Moral theologian ties wisdom, wisdom, parenthetically, seemingly so cerebral and esoteric, end of quote, to action. Thus, we may teach the Bible and be viewed by everyone as fountains of wisdom, refreshing those around us with pithy sayings and sage advice. Oh, he's wonderful. He's deep. Now, y'all need to stay with him. I'm telling you, God spoke into my heart with this statement from Kent Hughes. But if we're not full of mercy and good works, we're not wise. How radical and counterculture this is. It condemns many, and this was written in the 20th, 20th century dispersions of so-called wisdom. It's mercy and good works. Brother Bill, it's one thing to know that there's homeless children being abused. It's another thing to decide to do something about it. Mercy becomes aware of it. Good works address it. Mercy becomes aware that a person's in trouble. Good works picks up the phone or makes a visit. Oh, what's wrong with me this morning? I am flat fired up about this. If there's one thing I need to say, we need to come to the wedding altar of the cross and marry what we know with what needs to be done. Wow. It is not wisdom that knows. I've never heard anyone talk And maybe you could tell me, Lori, but I don't know how much education Teresa had. What was it? I'm saying St. Teresa, they call her. What is it? What do they call her? Miss Teresa. Mother Teresa. Mother. 
I've never heard anybody recognize her for what she knew. But she became famous to the world for what she did. And by the way, can I just quote factually? She touched the leper, pus and all. And most of us don't want to touch the pus. And you know what? We're like, I don't want to ever make a negative statement about a politician anymore than I do a preacher because some of my best friends are in this church are politicians and godly men and women. But as a crooked politician would lift his finger before he'd make a decision as to what he's going to do to help somebody, the church is not far from being guilty of the same crime. Where are God's first responders? Don't wait for somebody else to put their approval before you can respond. Be God's man, God's woman, and respond because it's the right thing to do. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, so much to say. These are your traits, your qualities. They remind us of Jesus. And I, I read this and I fall into such conviction. There's so many times that I have known, but I've not done anything. I've not picked up the phone. I just want to bow before you this morning and say thank you for a second chance. Help me today as I become aware of needs that I will not just be a man that's informed but inspired by the Lord Jesus to have good fruit. For Christ's sake, amen.